Welcome to Get It Done Entrepreneurs, where we talk with founders of companies who bet on themselves in one. My name is Rich Lebrun, and I am the founder and CEO of Lebrun Advisory Group. You can find us at rlebrun.com. Our mission is to help our clients build wealth through business ownership. Stick around to the end of the show and we'll reveal how you can be our next guest. Let me introduce you to our special guest today, who is Elon Geva, who is owner and founder in Elon Geva and Friends from Chicago. It's a branding and marketing service consultancy. Um, as I mentioned in the show before the start, uh, Elon's got such a long list of accomplishments. I'm just going to highlight some of these for my listeners. So his company manages all aspects of agency business, creative services, staff training, intern mentoring, and production. His clients included such uh, organizations as the Royal Commission of Riyadh City, Lisbon Convention Bureau, Mexican Tourism Bureau, uh, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun Times, Cars.com, Bueno Restaurants, Luna Negra Dance Company, and more. Business owner, board of director, member, author, university instructor, consultant, speaker, seminar leader, creative director, designer, and an expert in integrated marketing communications. Elon is a branding expert. He's a veteran in mentoring and managing, developing, executing, and implementing marketing strategies for all brand and, and brand touch points. He has won over 100 international, international and national awards, such as the Clio, the Addy, Echo, John Caples, Temple, the Summit, uh, Design USA, and more for work done in branding, print advertising, direct marketing, TV and graphic design and sales promotion. Uh, he is a winner of the 2006 Teaching Excellence Award from the University of Chicago, 2011 Distinguished Professor Educator Award from DePaul University and Designated Institute Facility, excuse me, faculty member of the In-Store Marketing Institute of 2007. He is a co-author of a book called Global Brand Management, which we're gonna chance to get to hear a little bit more about that. And he is married, has one son, uh, two grandkids, lives in Northbrook, Illinois. And with that said, welcome, Elon. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, I just want to make one tiny correction. Some of the clients that you mentioned are in, in the past. Um, yep. Because I had such long time in the business, you know, I, I happen to work with other advertising agencies that had many multinational clients. And among them were Nestle, Shell, American Express, uh, Citibank, Visa, United Airlines, and on and on and on. So sometimes when you are an employee of an advertising agency, you are lucky to get an assignment like the McDonald's account. Uh, and sometimes when you are a small entrepreneur, those big clients don't even talk to you. <laughs> they don't even look in your direction uh, because they tend to work with big multinational advertising agencies as well as branding companies. But I was very, very fortunate and very lucky that after my long career and experience, I was able to present to some clients my work as well as my team. And in some situations like a bid, I won and I won against those big advertising agencies, you know. So the small Ilan Geva and friends from Chicago or from Northbrook, Illinois, was suddenly competing against big multinational agencies based in Paris and so on. So, you know, even if you're a small business, don't be afraid of the big guys. Just go after them. You're on mute. I'm on mute, uh, listeners. I actually had a little coughing uh, stint there. I want to put myself on mute and forgot to take me off. But uh, thanks for thanks for letting me know. So, Elon, I was saying that uh, a lot of times major corporations, you know, uh, are always, they're always made up of people. And it's the talent within those corporations that really the, the customers are looking for. So, obviously, for you to be able to carry on uh, your customer service to such major corporations is an, uh, is an uh, Kudos to you. So, um, so let's say, what 
tell us a story then. You were in major advertising agency. I'll call that corporate America. Okay. But you then jumped off. You you went all in. You bet on yourself. You started your own company. Let's tell me a little bit about that story, that transition. How did that happen? Uh, you know, if I can make an observation about my life in corporate America, um, because I worked in other places around the world, I was I was born in the Middle East, so I worked for Tel Aviv-based agencies, and then out of a choice, I have positioned myself to work for global advertising agencies because I wanted the experience, and that was back in 1980. So I went through an incredible hiring process where I ended up being the design director of Ogilvy and Mather based in Johannesburg with clients all over Africa and, and the world. Because among those clients were, you know, clients like um, uh, pharmaceutical clients, food clients like Nestle. So I've done some assignments that really started to go uh, over the ocean into Europe and, uh, and uh, the rest of Africa. So there's a very big difference and it's very, very important when you work for a small company or even a large company, which is really regional versus a company that has 145 branches all over the world. And I was lucky to fall into one of those companies, Ogilvy and & Mather. And Ogilvy & Mather is one of the premier advertising agencies all over the world. They are really a leader. So when you work for a company like that, you really gain a lot of experience, a lot of insight. You learn a lot because the important thing is really to learn. For me, my main objective was to be independent, but I wanted to learn. And in my home country at the time in Israel of 1980, I did not have anybody to learn from. I reached the peak very quickly at a very young age and there was nowhere to go. We didn't have television, for example, in those days. There was no commercial television. So what could I do? You know, I could do only print advertising and nothing else. So that was my desire. My desire was always, if I belonged to a company, a corporation, I want the place to teach me something. I wanted to learn. I wanted to make serious advance in my career. If that was not offered, I was not happy. Now, later on, when I already worked for all these companies and I won the awards and got recognition and all that, there was another major impediment on my way to be totally happy. And it's called US immigration, because mm -hmm. I found myself in the United States as, a, as an alien, okay, mm -hmm. that had my, my status, my visa status dependent completely on an employer. And if I lost my job, I had to leave the country. Mm -hmm. There was simply no other choice. Sure. Okay? So I went through the whole thing. So, you know, for all of those, those of you who are listening, who have, you know, an unclear, unstable status with U.S. immigration, don't lose hope because one day it, the, the situation will be solved. The day, literally the day that I got my green card, because I was fortunate enough to find an employer who sponsored me mm -hmm. with a visa. And that takes a few years. The day I got my green card, I actually started Ilan Geva and Friends back in 1993 because I wanted to be on my own. You know, that's fascinating. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes we take for granted here you have this powerhouse of knowledge, wisdom, desire, passion, resources, uh, and you're held back by, you know, the citizenship, the, the uh, immigration okay. situation. And uh and I can see, I, I, I kind of got the picture. It's all pent up like a racehorse, you know, behind a gate. And then you get your green card and now you're free to go. So, Absolutely. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, to the listeners, don't lose hope. Elon's a good testament no. to uh, stay, no. stay, stay the course. So looking back, um, 
knowing what you know now since 1993, is, is there any decisions that you made that you think you would do differently? Um, it's a very interesting question because that really comes to personality. Um, would you work on your own? And as, as I told you before, you know, my concept of my business was a virtual agency, meaning I did not hire employees on purpose, but I had a whole cadre of consultants that I knew from my previous life in the agency world, and I would call on them to fill in when I got an assignment, a specific assignment, because I knew what their talents and skills are, and I could match them to the right assignment, okay? So with that said, I have a personality that I think I, I will not be a good employee, but I think that the benefit or the advantage that I have is that I acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm a tough cookie and there will be several of my friends who used to be my employers, my bosses, they're my friends, but they tell me to my face, you were a tough nut. <laughs> and I know it. Okay. I know it. Now, I'm using that skill as an independent when I'm talking vis a vis a client and I'm using my persuasion skills because I don't have a boss. I'm not going to piss off anybody in the company if I say something that the company doesn't like. Right. I am responsible for myself. So I take that chance. And in more cases than one, I, I'm, I win. I win. And you know, that, that gives you the freedom that you do not have as an employee because the company says to you, no, 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 you cannot say those things. Mm -hmm. When you're on your own and you run your business and your fate is in your hands, you can do as you please. Sometimes you rip the rewards. Sometimes you pay the price. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, on the flip side, you've become successful. Is there any one or two key decisions that you think were the catalyst behind your success that you did? You really, they're really, really good, solid decisions. I had few mentors in my life um, that I learned from. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for those people. Um, one of the things that I learned is patience. So I know that on many, many occasions, I, I was not patient. So if I look back and I'm saying to myself, what could you have done different? My answer would be, I would have been a little more patient. Okay. Because I was pushing and pushing and pushing and, as I said before, you know, some cases it works, some cases it doesn't work. But for those cases that it didn't work, if I look back, I say, you should have been a little more patient. So it was actually a good decision and one that you could maybe adapt a little bit. So either way, being patient is worth both sides of the coin for you. Correct. And I think that with the years and hopefully wisdom, um, this, this thing comes, you know, it's like my, my analogy is always because I love dogs. I have dogs and I'm looking at them until they're two years old. They're just crazy. Absolutely crazy. They run around and oh, it, it's crazy. Two years old, they settle mm -hmm. and they become sweeties, you know, and they just enjoy life and they don't care and they don't bug you. Fantastic. So I guess that with people, it also works that, you know, as you grow, and you have children and you have grandchildren, you learn about patience, you learn, you learn about giving and love. Uh, so it's, it's less, you know, like the rat race where we just go, 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 go. And, and we want to achieve everything and we want to swallow everything and eat everything that's on the table. Well, slow down. But sure. it depends on what stage in life. <clears throat> well, let's take a little commercial break here. Ilan, Geva, and friends, uh, tell us about your company specifically, who your customers are, and maybe what differentiates you 
That'd be the first question. And then the second question is you wrote this book, uh, co-authored this book called Global Brand Management. I'd like to know a little bit about that and what and how that would impact our listeners. So if you look at the structure of my clients today, what I did about 15 years ago, I took a very specific, you know, the road of my business could go into many, many avenues. One could be financial institutions, and I would work with banks. One would be tourism clients, and I would work with uh, ministries of tourism. One would be um, restaurants, fast food, and, and so on. But I chose about 15 years ago, and it was a complete coincidence. I chose to focus on something that is called medical tourism. And the medical tourism, the concept in principle is very simple. It is when people choose to go to another country to get medical treatments. But it is a growing market all over the world. And I became a sought after speaker in many, many medical tourism conferences around the world. And through those conferences, I get in touch with nations, meaning destinations that want to be in the medical tourism business, cities that want to sell themselves as a destination, hospitals, of course, clinics, and doctors. Now, among those people, you have governments, for example, ministries of health, ministries of tourism, um, chambers of commerce, city hall, and, and so on. These are my targeted customers because I am working with them to establish their brand, their destination brand, as the place to go to. Now, one would may probably ask, so what is the best place to go in the world? There isn't such thing mm -hmm. because the whole business of medical tourism is not really global. It is more regional. For example, uh, people in the United States will not go, even though because the prices here are very high, they will not fly all across the globe to the other side of the globe to Malaysia to get medical treatment. They won't do that. They may fly to Mexico, okay? They may go to Panama or, you know, any other, or Canada, if, if they so wish. So I am part of a consulting firm that is based in Dubai, and I became their director of strategy and the representative of that company in the United States. That company is called V Marsh Healthcare. And we are basically a global consulting firm that provides consulting services as well as facilitation to all those destinations that want to promote medical tourism. In addition to that, we do get other assignments, for example, uh, opportunities for franchising pharmacies in other countries. So I can just tell you without many details that in many, in many cases you have, in many countries you have the Walgreens and the CVSs of the world. Every country has one, two or three of those. But in addition to that, sometimes you have hospitals that develop their own pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And when they develop their own pharmacy, some of them call us and they say, you know what? We have a pretty nice business here of our own pharmacy. We would like to franchise that to other countries that do not have that opportunity. So we're doing that. Other cases could be uh, medical devices. There are some amazing scientists all over the world in places you wouldn't even think about, and they develop a device. And that device helps hospitals to improve the medical service. For example, um, special delivery of cancer treatment, okay, 
which helps the patients to heal quicker than the regular chemotherapy uh, uh, processes that we know. So just an example. Mm -hmm. But they come to us and they say, well, could you help us promote it to all the hospitals that you are talking to? So that's another business opportunity. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to the medical tourism side, we get calls from people that um, want to develop their country as a major destination in a specific region where their target audience is going to be from a specific region. So we help them do the feasibility studies. Um, and sometimes, you know, we come back and say, sorry, guys, you don't have a chance. It's not going to work. Well, let me let me ask you. You know, we had this whole idea of medical tourism. You and I had met years ago. You introduced me to this idea, still new idea, way before telemedical medical health took took to the country by storm. Yep. Um, I've heard enough stories out there that people have who have made the trip different parts of the world who've got medical treatment at better, equal to minimally. It definitely is sometimes better, and it's it's substantially less cost. Is this a, because you're trying to get to the consumer? Is this a, a learning curve for the consumer? Are they getting more comfortable going overseas, different parts of the world to get medical treatment? Because is telemedical health helping that? Is because people are saying I, I can just do non traditional medical treatment? Uh, is this still at the infant stage and the consumer market really hasn't caught on? Uh, tell us, just I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see this speak as a consumer. If I need to go over to a third world country, another part of the world, why would I and why wouldn't I do that? It probably most of it would be like fear, you know, and being in another country under a major medical condition. So, so you touch on some very interesting things because the the whole idea of medical tourism is not new. What's new is the marketing of medical tourism, but the the notion of going from one place to another for to seek medical solution is not new at all. That started back in the Roman Empire. Um, so the idea itself is not new. The delivery mechanisms, of course, with the internet, with Google, with everything else and telemedicine, like you mentioned, it, it changes the picture. And not only that, but suddenly there is a lot of it happening. Millions of people are traveling. And the reasons could be very, very different. I mentioned price. Okay, in the U.S., we know we we in the U.S. we have a horrible healthcare situation. Really, the, considering that we are such an advanced country with so much money, it's appalling what we have here. And in other countries, with much less money with much less well-known research, medical research institutions and hospitals with big star doctors, they're just doing fine. Actually very well, very well. And they find exactly the medical outcomes and solutions just like here, mm. okay? So it's a question of supply and demand. Some countries, because of their political system, like. England, they have a public health system, the national health system. And they have very long lines. You have to wait. If you need a knee replacement surgery in Britain, I don't know how many months you have to wait. So they say, the hell with it. And they go to Croatia. You know, it's a short flight. They can do it. They do it within a day. Uh, the price is much lower, and they wait a week or 10 days until they heal. They go through the therapy after, and they go back home. End of story. Mm. So that's one scenario. Yeah. Another scenario could be that there are complicated cases where there are very few doctors who can really, really solve a problem that other doctors already failed. And as a matter of fact, in the US, we have one of those best places that does that, and that's Mayo Clinic. 
Mm-hmm. And Mayo Clinic is a big, big, big global brand. It's an amazing brand. Uh, but they also have competitors because Mayo Clinic is not cheap. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it 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 varies, you know, the very it's very interesting that, for example, there are some countries that invested a lot in medical tourism. They built amazing hospitals amazing healthcare infrastructure. But when their prime minister is sick, he comes to Mayo Clinic. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I find this fascinating. I really do. And I'd love to see how this plays out in the years to come. Uh, Let's switch a little bit. Uh, Spend a few minutes. Tell us about this book you wrote, Global Brand Management. Uh, Who is it written for? And after I, if someone finishes reading, what will they get out of the book? I, okay. For our listeners, he's actually holding up a uh, visual of it. And we will put notes and or comments in the notes of the podcast for, for people who want to find the book. So I am uh, my co-writer on this book, uh, Professor Lawrence or Larry Minsky, whom I know for many years, we worked together, actually. Um, and as a professor, he wrote many books. I never wrote a book. I I was approached by people who said, look, with your life story and experiences and the fact that you lived on four continents, visited 60 countries, worked with many, many multinational clients, you should write a book. It it wasn't tempting for me for some reason. I, I didn't feel that I have the time or the patience to write a book. I was, I was then, I started to, one thing went away, my doubt, my self-doubt in my ability to write had diminished because I started to write many articles for magazines. Um, so I knew I can write. And plus, I used my writing skills in advertising. So I knew I can write. But then Barry came up and we discussed the whole idea of writing a book. And we said, here here is the difference between all the other branding books in this book. The difference is that the writers are both in academy, in academia, and they are practitioners. Because any other book that you see, it's either a 100% practitioner or 100% academian. And they don't necessarily know the other world. And here, both of us are active practitioners in the business of branding, advertising, and marketing. And we teach at universities. So that was the kind of perfect um, opportunity for two people of that particular skill to be together and write a book. Now, we wrote the book with the clear intention of making it a textbook for universities. Because we looked at other books and they did not, they were okay, but even the publisher who's based in London said, look, we have a couple of other books and and the publisher specializes in textbooks for education. They said, we have a couple of books, but they're really, they're, they're a little dated. Would you do something that is more up to date? And we said, sure. It took us two years. The book has 12 chapters, which is built perfectly for a semester Mm -hmm. system. Each chapter, we invited a guest from the world of branding, marketing, and other professors to write like a conclusion to to each chapter. So we have guests from all over the world, from Italy, Korea, Germany, people that are senior people in the world of advertising, and they added everything that they wanted to add to a specific chapter that we gave gave them. So that make, and of course there are PowerPoint presentations for each chapter. So any professor who wants to take this and teach with this book, it's a ready to go, buy it and run with it. (laughs) Fantastic. 
Okay, so you got this background of uh, traveling the world, interfacing with all different people from different continents. You've been in business for a long time, so you weathered a lot of different uh, economic storms. Uh, but today, okay, especially someone who deals on a global national, uh, global front, in the U.S. alone, yeah, yet alone the world, we have so many headwinds: uh, labor uh, labor issues, supply chain, uh, oil. Uh, inflation, uh, politics, uh, you know, you name it, we got it going on right now, right? So how are you navigating your company to uh, in during these tough times or tough times that are coming ahead? Do you see this opportunity? This is time to scale, adapt, divert, diversify. How are you dealing with that? And then the second part of the question, um, how are you personally dealing with that as a CEO of your company? What gets you up in the morning? The first part of your question is difficult because I really don't live in the American economy. What do I mean? Most of my income comes from other countries. Most of my clients are not Americans. So I, I don't live the exasperation that some businesses have here. Um, yes, of course, everybody suffers because the economy is a global economy. And with the situation in Ukraine and everything and the oil prices, yeah, it, it touches everybody. There is no doubt. But because I focused in one specific area like the medical tourism business, um, I don't see that much of a problem. On the contrary, because we are now post COVID, the travel industry is coming back. So patients can fly from one place to another. Um, prices of healthcare services in many places around the world are extremely competitive. So depending where you come from and where you wanna to go to, there are there is enough competition and there is enough um, supply for people to get whatever they need. So we are not really touched by that. Now, I added to my list of services, I added training and education. So I am training people in other countries to do what I do, to be in the medical tourism business. So training is not affected because I can do it on Zoom today. I don't have to travel. I can sit exactly where I am now and teach a class of 80 people in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So that th th there is no effect. So technology, you know, it's like you mentioned telemedicine. I'm basically doing telemedicine, but I'm doing training. Sure. So technology is helping a lot of businesses to do what they did before. They don't have to pay transportation. You know, it's, it's really not that expensive. I mean, a Zoom account is not an expensive business uh, cost. Very cost effective. Yeah. So you're not affected the way, because you, as you mentioned, you're not necessarily in the US doing the things that typically US companies do. You yeah. are affected by some of the worldwide events that are going on to travel alone, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure COVID affected your business. Yeah. Um, this, this is a side question. Is there a hub, I'm thinking about the consumer, tapping into your resources to get to another doctor in another country. Is there a hub where consumers go and you help them filter all that out? If I needed a surgery, I wouldn't even know where to go in the world to get my options. Is there a place that you've created a hub for people to come to? No, uh, because this is not my role. Okay. Um, the role that you mentioned, the hub, as you call it, there are some... Um, there are some places that have developed uh, portals for medical tourism, and there are quite a few of them. Uh, there are portals in Germany, there are portals in Portugal, there are portals in Asia, you know, so again, by region, mm -hmm. there are medical tourism portals that offer supposedly the entire service, meaning if you're a patient and you seek remedy, they will offer you everything, including buying your air ticket, dealing with your visa to that country, okay? 
dealing with ground transportation from the minute you land, taking you to the hospital, putting your family in a hotel, waiting for the entire period of your treatment, including rehabilitate, excuse me, rehabilitation, and then they take care of your trip back home, and they take care of the follow-up after your return, because th there is follow-up, there has to be. And that's part of it is being solved by telemedicine because your doctor in the other country can get on Zoom with you mm -hmm. and you can go through how you're feeling, show me your stitches, uh, whatever it is. So that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But the portals themselves are part of a marketing strategy that I may offer some people in other locations. That makes sense. That makes sense. Total sense. Okay. So this is a very unique answer. I'm curious about your answer. It'd be a question that I think would be common, but you are dealing with such a global world. Who are your customers? You know, if my listeners are listening to you, you know, they're all, almost all of them are U.S. based, although we have some people around the world. Uh, who is your customer? How that would be that you could utilize your service? Ministries. Ministries could be Ministry of Health, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Trade, because in various countries, those are the kind of ministries that are dealing with medical tourism. Um, as I mentioned, for example, Chamber of Commerce, I may be invited to speak in a symposium or conference or congress and after that, I'm being approached by people that say, can you help us on this, this, and the other? Um, uh, VMARSH Healthcare, which, by the way, is based in uh, the main offices in Dubai. We have a service office in Mumbai, in India. We have a service in Cairo. We have an office in Kuala Lumpur. Excuse me, and we have representatives in South America. So we are quite global in the sense that each one of our offices is in tune with the needs of the region. And they, for example, again, without mentioning names, but there is a hospital chain in, in Asia that is now interested. They exist already. The hospital exists, but they have not served international clients. Mm -hmm. So they want to develop that. So they will hire us as their consulting firm and training firm on how to build the international division within the hospital. Well, I don't want to leave, this is my impression, so clarify, are we more, is the U.S. more of an exporting of customers than seems like because we have expensive medical care, we have a lot of expertise over here too, more people looking to travel outside of the U.S. around the world, or, or, or is there certain circumstances where people from around the world uh, use this in medical tourism and come over to the U U.S.? It's very hard to, to, uh, to name numbers and figures because there is no data. There is no accurate data that one can rely on. We know for a fact that only from California, Southern California, every year there is an average of a million people crossing the border to Mexico, to Tijuana, for dental services. I heard that. Now, there are other Americans that are crossing the border to Mexico from El Paso, from, uh, you know, there, there are few crossing points, and they go to hospitals and clinics in Mexico. Some of them are wonderful, some of them are less, but hey, people need solutions. So, Again, the number doesn't mean anything because if you go for a dental treatment, it's not, it could be either cosmetic, yeah, it could be also medical, but it's not a big major problem. Mm -hmm. It's not cancer. Mm -hmm. When you have cancer, people don't leave the US to other countries. That's the opposite. That's where people come here. They will go to MD Anderson in Texas and they will go to, um, uh, Sloan Catering in New York. So, you know, those those are the kind of differences between what is the actual 
sickness, what is the medical condition. If it's a big one, then people come to the US. If it's cosmetic surgery, bariatric surgery, dental, those are the small potatoes. And, and for that, people may go to other destinations because it's convenient, it's cheaper, quicker, whatever. Well, thank you for the answer. And I can only see this becoming more and more global. We're, we're becoming more and more of a global world, anyhow, uh, in exchanging services. Oh. And I think we get some of the oh, some of these barriers down. Uh, the ultimate goal is to get the best treatment for the most cost-effective price. That, that's the goal for everybody, I'm sure, in the world. Elon, this has been fascinating. Uh, before we go, I want to ask if people want to get in touch with you uh, this, and have this conversation directly with you. What's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I have a website, and, and the name is very simple. Elonbrands.com. That's it. Okay? Very good. So, I-L-A-N-Brands.com. That's one way to reach me. My profile is on LinkedIn, and anybody can reach me through LinkedIn. I will be happy to connect and discuss. And... You know, the phones today, <laughs> Verizon came up with this genius idea that they kill any number that they don't know. So, <laughs> so that phone spam is working so well that nobody can call me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, so email is very simple as well. Elon at elonandfriends.com. And the word end is spelled A-N-D. Very good. We will put that information in the notes of the podcast, uh, which will be airing for our listeners who are not able to attend. Uh, you'll be able to hear that on all podcast platforms uh, in about three weeks. Okay, Elon, I just want to say thank you. I know you're a very busy man. Thank you for taking time out of your day to share your wisdom, your insight, and a topic that I'm sure many people are not really familiar with. I know I wasn't when you first introduced it to me a couple of years ago. So with that, I wish you uh, the best for the day and thank you again for your time. Thank you very much, Rich. It's been a pleasure. Have a great Same. day. Same here. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Rich LeBron here. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast, Get It Done Entrepreneurs. If you are a successful business owner who would like to be on this program, please visit us at rlebrun.com forward slash podcast and fill out the form and we will reach out to you. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on the socials. If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag Get It Done Entrepreneurs. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content. To make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Go to our website, rlebrun.com, or follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time.